Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the keynote session. Uh, Dana Burtness will be moderating today. I just wanted to quickly thank our sponsors for uh, allowing this for it to, ha to happen and for all of you for joining us. Um, so Dana, if you would like to take it away, thank you to all our keynote panelists for being here as well. Yeah, sure. I will take it away. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, it's so good to be here virtually with you all. Um, I'm going to keep this really brief because we have a lot of really juicy questions to cover with our three amazing panelists. Um, so very quickly, I'm Dana Burtness. I'm a pastured hog farmer at Nettle Valley Farm. We run an incubator farm program for young agrarians in southeastern Minnesota. Um, I'm also a very proud and very stoked member of the Savannah Institute Advisory Committee. And um, I would love it if our three panelists would introduce themselves and feel free to brag. All right, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll start with Anna. Hi, everybody. I'm Anna LaPay, and I am uh, zooming in from an office in which I've spent a lot of time over the past couple of years during the pandemic and uh, wish we could all be together in person. But, uh, you know, virtual better than nothing. Uh, I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I uh, I'm an author. I've written books on food uh, and food systems transformation. My most recent book was about the links between food systems and the climate crisis. And I uh, work with a, a group of folks at Real Food Media that works on communication strategy and public education and also work with funders that are really trying to look at how can philanthropy be part of moving the needle toward more agroecological food systems. So really great to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, thank you for being here. Eliza, we'll have you go next since you're in order on my screen. All right, hi everybody. My name is Eliza Greenman and I am an orchardist and historical horticulturalist and or a horticultural historian. Um, fruit explorer, I have pigs sometimes. And so I'm really into tree crops mostly. Um, it's mostly what I think about all day, every day. And uh, yeah, I'm in Northern Virginia and I'm the founder of Hog Tree, which is basically how to offset livestock feed um, through the use of tr fruit trees. Um, yeah, I sell charcuterie, hogtree.com, that's about <laughs> it. And thank you, Eliza and Beth. Hi everybody, I'm Beth Dooley. I'm a cookbook author and food writer. Um, I am a James Beard Award um, food writer and my focus is on trying to connect uh, home cooks primarily with the work that all of you are doing um, because it's so important and the food is so delicious. So, and I've always found that recipes are um, sort of an interesting vehicle to convey information people might not come across otherwise. So that's the focus of a lot of what I do. Thank you three. Okay, so in a moment here, I'm gonna invite everybody, panelists and audience to take a really big breath and invite in some joy and hope and fire in this moment because Lord knows we need it, you know, in the face of all this. Um, so think about something that brings you joy and hope and lights a fire in your belly. And, and then in one sentence, I would love it if everyone would just share that in the chat and I'm gonna have the panelists share it aloud. Okay, everybody ready? All right. <sighs> Okay, I can't wait to see the chat light up <laughs> with good things. Beth, what came up for you? What, what, what's bringing you joy and peace and fire today? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, you know, it's interesting. My son, Kip Dooley, and I have a blog that we started, oh, about oh, like right at the beginning of the pandemic around basic techniques um, so that cooks could approach any ingredient and and know what to do with it you know rather than start with the recipe and kind of march into the grocery store um, it was just a way to excite people about trying ingredients that they might not try otherwise and I think what's been really fun is to see the results to see the members of this blog get really interested and then share what they're cooking and we kind of push them to start using more grains, for instance, more whole grains like oat groats and rye berries and wheat berries and um, foods like that. Some of the tree crops like elderberries that they 
might not have wanted to try that they're now trying. And so I think what's been really fun for me is to see how excited they get and how they want to share that. So, um, so that's what's been hopeful for me is that there's a lot of interest in this work right now. That's wonderful. Uh, Eliza. I am really excited right now about the fact that we've had some cold, some, you know, kind of a normal cold winter in, in Virginia that hasn't, we haven't seen in a while. And uh, the trees are running like crazy. So one of my, my, a neighbor of mine texted me this morning to tell me that he had 20 gallons of black walnut sap that he's gotten wow. today and he's going to boil it down and my little neighbor's going to come over with me and we're going to go try it. And I'm just really excited about introducing, you know, syrup in to a, to, to little kids in the South. Like it's not, it's, it's kind of a phenomenon that doesn't happen all the time. So it's also delicious. Love it. And what about you, Anna? Uh, well, thanks for the question. And I love this focus on what is bringing us joy. And I love seeing everybody's comments in the chat. Mm -hmm. as you asked the question is a source of joy that I've been hanging on to now for a couple of years, which is the experience I had just before the pandemic started. Uh, I got to travel to Andhra Pradesh in India uh, with a group called the Agroecology Fund. It was a learning exchange with uh, folks from all around the world. I think there was maybe people from 52 different countries uh, going, uh, coming together to learn about agroecological farming practices and sharing. And so we had uh, indigenous potato farmers from Peru, and we had uh, folks uh, from Ghana, uh, we had folks from all around the world. And it was so powerful to connect with the joy that uh, everyone was sharing about their work and their deep connection to the land and to farming. And also the joy we all experienced of seeing just how, how much this uh, natural farming has expanded across the region. So when we were there, 700,000 farmers were part of this now government sub subsidized agroecological farming practices there. And so that is a joy I've held on to, uh, memories of that experience. But then just yesterday, I talked with a colleague who's based in West Africa, and he was sharing how he's been part of, since then, a growing network of farmer-to-farmer -farmer education between Southern India and 15 countries across mostly um, Western and Northern Africa, but 15 countries across the continent of Africa of farmers who are sharing across these regions to learn about how to bring these practices to their land, some of which is definitely connected to agro, uh, both agroecology and agroforestry. So it was just a reminder that in the face of what I feel like is a bombardment of bleak news, uh, that there's so much positive work happening and so many people connecting despite a pandemic that has physically kept us apart. So that is bringing me joy. Oh, this is gr so great. And thank you for everyone for sharing all the wonderful things. Seeing roasted chestnuts, my animals. Uh, final prep for prairie snow seeding. Oh, water buffalo under chestnut. Hick oh my gosh, you guys all better be giving nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, the first question that I have is sort of selfish because I, I really want to hear the answer to this, but all three of you are women with very deep expertise in your fields, and we all know how experts love to totally geek out on something that they're currently super stoked about. So I'm wanting to know what is sparking off new and big ideas in your brain. Um, it could be an ingredient. It could be a species. It could be a current collaboration. Um, so ready, set, go. And I'm going to talk about, I'm going to, I'm going to hand this to Eliza first. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm, <laughs> I'm excited about a lot of things. Um, I, and I think that's because of the company I keep. I have a, I just have an incredible network that's surrounding me and they're all excited and passionate. And so I sort of absorb that. Um, but for right now, one of the things I'm most excited about is, <laughs> The fact, well, it's built on sort of a, a sad thing in, in that there's a big feed shortage going on in China. And, um, but what's that that's pushed them to do is over the last few years is to start doing a lot of real research into feed alternatives. And so they're sort of at the forefront right now of really awesome 
um, tree crops research and how to feed livestock off of tree leaves. And, you know, they're, I mean, they're going for it. And so it's really cool to see that um, because in the United States, it's not necessarily anything of importance, but in my realm of perennials, um, in my realm of trying to feed livestock off of trees, like it's, it's just so good to see um, because you don't get research like this every day. So we're at, we're at the, the beginning of, or maybe tip of the iceberg with it. And there's so much to come. Super exciting. And yeah, Beth, what, what's coming up for you? What do you, you know, um, I'm, I'm the hazelnuts. <laughs> I love the work being done on hazelnuts right now. And I'm very fond of the American hazelnut company up in Ashland. We have friends that live up there. And um, the hazelnut oil is awesome. The hazelnuts themselves come toasted and ready to use. The hazelnut flour makes fabulous crackers. So I've been goofing around with a lot of hazelnut stuff. Um, and then also seeing the work that's going on in the Hmong community um, specifically, one of the farmers I've been friends with who um, has been working mostly, growing mostly vegetables and, and helping other Hmong farmers expand their, um, their crops is now getting into orchards because she understands that that will then provide a future for her kids and her kids' kids because she is recognizing the potential for perennials. So um, I think that's pretty exciting too, that we're seeing more and more people understand how important they are um, in a variety of different ways. And they're delicious, they're amazing. Yeah, I'll say, yeah, yeah. And Anna, geek out. What do you want to geek out about? Well, I love this question because I feel like I, I spent a lot of my day geeking out. Uh, and But I also feel like this kind of careens us into uh, maybe the the not tapping so much of the joy. Uh, I mean, definitely some of what I geek out about is, is, is you both were talking about so much of the positive research. But one of the things I've been geeking out about and really curious about and working with some collaborators uh, uh, with different um, institutions around the world is looking at what is it that we know and don't know and how do we then answer the questions that we need to about the, um, the climate impacts of the agricultural inputs of pesticides and synthetic fertilizers and what are we seeing kind of looking forward uh, in terms of investments from the fossil fuel industry that are going to potentially, you know, dramatically increase the amount of synthetic fertilizer being used and produced, the amount of pesticides uh, being produced and trying to from that research really elevate the public conversation, particularly among policymakers and climate funders who understand what a crisis we face, but might have not necessarily put agriculture and agricultural inputs into the climate conversation. When we know we're starting to see uh, a number of new uh, fracking sites, and particularly in the Northeast that are coming online, conjoined with synthetic fertilizer plants, we know there is this deep connection, uh, but uh, we need a lot more reporting on uh, the trajectory of these industries. And so that's something I've been geeking out about and fascinated with and feel like real concern that if we don't increasingly connect the story of climate uh, with the story of these industrial ag inputs that we're missing a huge escape hatch for the fossil fuel industry. Sobering. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, that's that's what we have to talk about the real stuff. Um, I'm gonna actually skip ahead a little bit in my questions because I think this might segue well into that. Um, so we all know that the challenges we face in the world and at you know in all these different topics are just beyond immense, and we need to take action at every level possible. It can't just be plant a tree, re recycle a can, change your light bulbs. And the idea of, you know, nothing can change until we have global unity on something is also very hard to stomach. Um, but we have to kind of work on all of these different levels. And so I'm wondering if each of you could give some examples of, of things that we all can be doing on a, a local level, a community wide level, you know. Forget the individual level. That's where that you know most of the media focuses on just what we can do. But what what have you 
seen and what would you encourage on community levels? But then, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and work some magic at the federal level or the global level, what are some of those things that you would want to see us work towards? And let's see, Beth, let's start with you. Uh, you know, it's a great question. And it's something that I think about a lot. Um, I mean, we all know that federal government policy is one of the biggest barriers to change for a lot of our farmers, right? It's difficult for a lot of farmers to change the way they're doing things because they're getting paid by our government to use worse practices. And so I think in our outreach efforts as we're communicating to other people, trying to tie the political impacts of and the social and human impacts of those policies to what goes on in the kitchen is really important because we need somehow to figure out how to link all of those chains together in the, the food chain. Like it goes all the way up to policy. And, um, you know, some of the big farmers will admit that they're really welfare recipients when it comes to um, commodity price supports, crop loss insurance, all of those policies that are, are really keeping them stuck. So if there was a way to message how to shift those dollars to support real change, I think that would be incredible. And like a, one of my one of my friends who's a farmer says, you know, if you want to, you know, do something different, do something different. If you want to, you know, affect big change, see something different. And so I would love to hear from a policymaker about how to move an agenda that addresses the federal programs forward. Anna, I'm gonna pass it over to you next since I know you work a lot in this, in mm -hmm. the policy world. Yeah, well, I love everything you said, Beth. And, you know, I, I completely agree that we need to think about our impact in these concentric circles all the way up to the national and even to the global. And also that even for me, you know, thinking about that, it, it feels it is overwhelming. And so there is this, you know, there's the cliche of kind of putting your, your own oxygen mask on first in the <laughs> airplane. You know, there is this way in which for me, I've found that grounding myself in the daily practice of cooking food that feels so aligned with what it is I want to see in the world, like that is so meaningful to me. And, um, and I, I think for a lot of people, it can be so meaningful. And so like, the work that you do, Beth, is so critical in that, and that there is a way that in getting people to think about what they feed themselves and think about the barriers that they may experience when trying to feed themselves the food that is the most nourishing, that that can be a real activator to getting people to experience a sense of wait a second, why is it so hard for me to find this variety of food or find hazelnuts or, you know, whatever it is. And, and, and it can be a way to get people to realize that what we experience as individuals is a reflection of policy choices. It's not inevitable uh, that there were choices that were made that either enable an environment that helps us eat in alignment with our values or disables that. Um, so I think that is really important piece of it, that individual experience piece. And then to kind of scale up, I think that uh, there are, for me, I feel like I really lean on and and uh, and want to see how I can support groups like the Savannah Institute or other civil society organizations that are connecting food producers uh, with policymakers and with policy advocacy to be that voice on Capitol Hill, to be that counterpoint to lobbyists, to be able to voice the kinds of um, advocacy for the policy change we need. So, you know, the fact that agribusiness has more lobbyists on Capitol Hill than the oil and gas industry is a huge barrier to having our voices heard. And yet we are seeing progress. I'm being really curious uh, on Monday when uh, uh, Secretary Vilsack has uh, his uh, press conference on climate smart agriculture. I'll be very curious to hear what the USDA is saying. What kinds of policies are they pushing forward? And the fact that they're even having this conversation to me is a reflection that groups around the country have been successful in trying to shift the agenda 
agenda. But of course, we need to be louder. We need to be more engaged. And again, I think one of the most powerful ways that I feel like I can do that as an individual is through civil society organizations that can have that kind of presence on Capitol Hill. Love it. And since we've, since Anna has made the very good argument about bringing back in the individual level actions, <laughs> I, I uh, would invite Eliza to, to talk about um, actions and ideas on all of those levels. Yeah, what I'm, what I've been focused on in my educational pursuits or in teaching or in talking to people has really been for people to embrace chaos and to sit with it and to get curious about chaos, like in their lives and especially on their landscapes. Um, because we, we live in such a reductionist world right now. And also like that, that to me leads to ecological witch hunts and it leads to um, really narrowing our mind, our, pros our mind and narrowing like just our awareness of where we're living and what's going on. And so for me, like, I'll just give an example is, you know, I'm in Virginia. I have tons of invasive plants around me. And the, the sort of witch hunt idea is, well, we have to get rid of it. It's spreading, it's chaos, you know, we gotta, it's, it's uncontrollable. And so where I'm heading is, okay, sure. We need, we need to do something about this, but our current ways of doing it aren't sustainable and they ultimately are buying into a system that's going against the policies that would be more regenerative or more sustain, you know, more ecologically friendly, um, per, you know, like for instance, buying herbicides and things like that. So sitting with it, coming up with ideas, getting curious, learning what these plants do, learning what these weeds do, like, you know, what eats them, what's going on, how do we manage this naturally is an example that, that I have, have really died just gone into is so yeah we have an issue here um it's chaotic and there's not just one we can't it's it's really beneficial to break outside of the common narratives and just get curious and really embrace it you know go for it do what you want you can't do anything wrong really um so yeah if if everybody can just step outside of just sit with it you know, just sit with it and see where your mind goes rather than kill, kill, kill using, you know, the regular, the regular means that are, you know, brought to us to our to Southern states or to these feed stores or whatever. So that's something that I see because ultimately it's something that you can, it's a mindset that you can have that, that addresses a systemic problem, which you know, Anna has talked about of, of pesticides and fungicides and all these toxins going into our landscape because we're not, we're not really getting curious about what these are and what they could serve. Because if human nature serves us, if human history serves us correctly, whenever we find a use for something, that plant goes extinct. <laughs> and so, um, so that's, yeah, that's where I'm at with this. Embrace the chaos. 2022, mm -hmm. embrace the chaos. <laughs> uh, that leads perfectly into the next question I had. Um, so binary red and green thinking is so prevalent these days. You know, everything is either fully red, like full stop, don't touch it, or fully green, full speed ahead. Um, and it's so tempting to think in these extreme ways. Um, like, I don't know, in the, in the regen ag world, it's like tillage, tillage is the devil no tillage. And for me as a pastured hog farmer, it's like, well, I'm managing 80 little tillage machines. You know, how, how am I supposed to fit into that? Um, or certain species like corn, corn has been um, demonized as, and sort of held up as the, the bane of, of modern agriculture's existence. Um, what's a conversation in your world, in your spheres, that you think could use a lot less of that binary red and green thinking and what, and some, some nuance that really could be brought to that. And, um, Anna, you're, you're nodding your head. It's <laughs> like, you have, I'm going to start with you. 
Well, when you're asking that question, you said this red, red and green thinking, I thought you were going to say red and blue, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, sort of the political polarization I thought you were getting at. Uh, but but I want to stick with that for a second because I do feel like that is a part of what I'm what I'm experiencing uh, is this sense of uh, the way the story is getting told about what is happening in this moment is this intense polarization and this way in which the kinds of conversations that we're even having today about food become so polarized. And if you're talking about certain ways of farming, does that mean you know you're sort of aligned with a certain party or it's a, a this kind of political polarization? polarization of so many of our conversations. And as part of that, this story that we as a, um, as a country are so polarized. And I think that that's actually a not help. Well, it's not helpful, but I also don't think it's true. And I uh, was really um, moved over the years by the kind of social science literature about um, kind of communicating about environmental issues and social problems. And what so much of the literature tells us is that if you go deeper on issues, go beneath kind of, again, this polarization talk and even some of the language that people use that might feel alienating, if you go beneath that kind of conversation to a, a conversation about values, what you find, and there's been good like, polling about this across this country, what you find when you talk on a values level is there is a deep alignment across people, rural and urban and uh, coastal and, uh, and uh, in the middle of the country it's, and all across demographics, you find a real alignment around shared values. So there's such a, to me, there's a lot of hope in that. So shared values around when you really ask people, you know, do you want to have uh, water that runs clean? Do you want to have air that's clean? Do you want to have abundant food? Do you want to uh, have food that's nourishing? I mean, these fundamental values are really held tight by so many of us. And so one of the things I've been working on with colleagues across the country is a um, uh, a procurement policy called the Good Food Purchasing Program. So it's a, a policy uh, that cities can adopt and uh, we're hoping states can adopt too, that would help institutions like schools make purchasing choices that are guided by these shared values. And what we're finding in the communications about this policy is people are excited, again, across what might be considered polarized, but they're excited when they hear you talk about the values of we want food that's good for the environment that was produced with workers and farmers at its heart with their well-being in mind, where animals were treated uh, with animal welfare uh, protected, where it's good for your health, it's good for local economies, those kinds of values. And so I just, that, that came up as you asked the question, Beth, about what do I feel like is a conversation that, that, that kind of promotes that polarization? And it is, I think, this misrepresentation that we are more divided than I actually think we are. Uh, and, and I would offer for that and going to that values conversation can be a way of finding that true alignment that I think is there. What you're saying really resonates with me a lot. A few years back, our, our community had a, a, a big factory farm fight. And um, even though the residents in this area are really uh, diverse politically, um, clean water is what really brought us all together. Um, okay. Beth, in your world, what's a, what's a conversation that you feel it could use some more nuance and you know, that's, that's a great question. You know, and I want to give you a shout out for the good food um, purchasing program because it's being used by the Minneapolis public school systems. And um, we're still trying to get the University of Minnesota to buy in, but we'll get there, <laughs> you know. So it's a good place to start because they're really clear guidelines. And I think they're very helpful to um, people that are in purchasing departments make decisions. Um, you know, I, I mean, it, to me, it just comes back to sitting down at the table and talking, right? Um, and when I look at the work that Sean Sherman does, for instance, at the sous chef's um, indigenous kitchen, which, you know, is a beautiful restaurant and then also has a patio and um, a really casual component to it so that it can provide really good food for, you know, a lot of different people from different parts of the city. And it's located on the banks of the Mississippi River, um, where you know it's a very sort of sacred place for um, Ojibwe people, and just being there is incredibly, um, you know, it just makes you feel in place. Uh, 
And it makes us realize how connected we are to something like this river in the area that we live in. Um, and that you can sit there and order off a menu things that you may never have tasted before, but they kind of deliver the message that we can all share in this. And I think, you know, we're seeing more and more of that kind of work um, being done by chefs from a whole variety of different backgrounds. And it does change the conversation, I think, so. I love that, that vision of abundance. Yeah. Uh, Eliza, you started to, you shared a bit about uh, a conversation in your world that could use a lot more nuance. Um, any others? <laughs> or do you want to expound on that one? <laughs> no, I'll leave, I'll leave invasive be for right now because they're controversial enough as it is. Um, but, you know, one of, one of the other polarizing things in my life that I've noticed and I've, um, and I've embraced in a way is um, the idea that we have to have sort of glistening orbs of perfection um, in order to eat them, like to market them and whatnot. And so there's been a lot of work in the, you know, in the last few years around um, eating ugly in, in that campaign. And that's, that's been really great. But I mean, just to keep going on that, like people, it's really hard sometimes, like in thinking about economic diversification on farms and whatnot, like in, I would really love to see the embrace of more processing industries and more vet, you know, that give, give farmers, I mean, these fruits, you know, for instance, like, I, so I'm a fruit farmer primarily and like an apple that has apple scab on it, which is seen as unmarketable in a grocery store setting has has, has higher amounts of sugar, you know, it has higher amounts of polyphenols. Um, not me. And, uh, and so ultimately, like, it's a higher nutrition, nutritive fruit, you know, and so and yet, it's getting downgraded. And so something that I'm really interested in is embracing that finding new revenue streams. Um, and there's a lot of people out there that are working for that. And that's really great, but they're up against Goliaths where, um, you know, uh, unfortunately some of that ugly food movement has been co-opted as being a waste stream for um, conventional growing and conventional thought, whereas, and there's no ecological benefit. Um, so that's, that's something that I'm really interested in moving forward is, is really encouraging and lifting up um, those who just different thoughts for how to grow different fruits and how to grow different nuts and how to grow different food because it's not just farmers markets it's not just you know you're growing it for the grocery store um, there, there's a lot more coming down the pike and so just connecting and spreading that gospel I want that to spread to, you know, eat, eat ugly fruit, but also eat ugly vegetables. I, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I feel like I read at some point that, you know, uh, uh, insect, uh, vegetables that have had insect pressure and insect damage actually have higher levels of antioxidants in certain, you know, that's, that's the rumor we need to start is like the, the next trendy thing needs to be like, oh, look how, uh, flea beetle ridden this arugula is. It's like, 10 times better for me. So just, right. you heard it here. You heard it here first. Let's start that rumor. <laughs> yeah. And, and just don't reject that notion. You know, so many people, like if there's a blemish on an apple, they immediately think worm. And so just, you know, bringing about this idea that, oh, this, you know, maybe it's not a worm or even if it is, let's talk about the benefits. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would love it if you each took the time to, to lift up a few unsung people or projects or movements that you are, are really inspired by right now. Um, and I am going to challenge you to lift up a project of your own that you would love people to know about um, and toot your own horn a little bit. And let's see, uh, Eliza, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, in my realm, in the tree crops realm, <laughs> almost everybody is unsung in, in it because they're, they're all flying below the radar. You know, they're, 
sometimes they're landless. Sometimes they're, you know, a retiree that's trying to get one more generation of breeding before they die. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's the long, there are these people that have taken the very long game to improve, to find and improve and grow and supply um, tree crops to the United States because that's what we need. We need, you know, they're, they're the harbingers of biodiversity and getting it onto, onto farmscapes. You know, to me, the, the people that are fiddling with, with all the, in the tree crops realm are the basis of agroforestry because you need them plus, ultimately you need them plus land. Um, so yeah, some people that come to mind that are really unsung and some also there's some cool co cooperatives that I'll give a shout out to, but you know, one person is, his name is Mike Knave and he is, he is, oh, he, the amount of chestnut information that man is, is giving out and just due to his passions, due to his life's work, um, he, he shares volumes of information for free to everybody. And he's, he is moving the needle on America and growing chestnuts, especially Chinese chestnuts and, and Chinese American hybrids in the United States. So that's just one person. Another person would be in the chestnut realm is Dr. Sandra and Agnostakis. Um, who she's retired from the Connecticut Experimental Research Station and tired still, it's her life, it's what she does. Um, and the, just, you know, the, shout out to the most passionate people with the, with the long, long intergener extra generational views. Um, and then of course, there's some exciting stuff happening, at least on the East Coast that I'm familiar with, with like Keystone Tree Crops Co Cooperative, which is, you know, a group of, uh, older people and younger people getting together, pooling resources, creating value-added tree crops, create, you know, finding those good, those good genetics, propagating them, breeding them, distributing them, um, you know, other people, Nutty Buddy Collective in North Carolina, things like that. So just shout out to all those tree crops people out there that are feeling really lonely because uh, it's a long, lonely road sometimes. Um, I have noticed that you've forgotten to shout yourself out about something. <laughs> you didn't think I was going to let you skip that part, did you? Oh, I can't give myself a shout out. <laughs> talk, talk about, talk about what hog tree is doing with the drop schemes just a little bit. Sure. So my business hog tree is about taking these unsung, uh, apple and pear and persimmon and chestnut cultivars that have fallen out of favor in the United States because you know, fruit selection, nut selection, they were selected for being able to store or being able to ship to, to major markets um, and also for being beautiful. But there's thousands of other cultivars out there and it, they're declining very quickly um, due to land changing over and things like that. So I created Hog Tree as an attempt to try and bring value or bring practic practical use to these unknown or obscure uh, fruit and nut cultivars um, in order to get them back on the landscape. Because in order to preserve biodiversity, you have to give it a job as far as I'm concerned, especially in this agroforestry realm. Um, and that has been a long and lonely road too, but I'm happy to say uh, it, seems, it seems like it's getting healthier and healthier every day. I love that. Along those lines, I, I see that Barbara, at, you asked earlier, Dana, what is your source of joy? Well, mainly Eliza's hog tree work since I'm a pig <laughs> farmer and the fact that Eliza is going to help me plant a little mini orchard on, on my farm this spring, yeah. which I'm super stoked about. Um, Beth, what about you? What are some, um, who are some unsung heroes and unsung projects? And then be prepared to, to lift up a project of your own too. Okay, thanks. Um, God, there's so many of them, it's really hard to choose. <laughs> um, and I just wanna give a quick shout out to um, Diet for Small Planet's 50th anniversary because it's, it's remarkable that that book was written 50 years ago, right? But what I love about the 50th anniversary edition is um, 
both Anna and her mom, Frances, talk about the work that's ongoing and what's happened since that book first launched. And that gives me a tremendous amount of hope. Um, and then the, the projects that I've really fallen in love with, one of them is um, The Good Acre, which is a food hub in Minneapolis that aggregates um, you know, produce, tree fruit produce as well, um, and brings it up to code so that small farmers have access to large markets. So it's getting, you know, this beautiful food into um, institutions, school systems, and, uh, you know, nursing homes and hospitals, because those, those farmers didn't have access to those markets. So it's addressing some of the things you just talked about, Eliza. And then it's, they've also now added to it a teaching component where the lead chef is, is bringing in school service directors and um, school cafeteria cooks to learn how to start cooking again, because so many of those schools still have kitchens, but they've been ordering everything from Sodexo and these other big distributors. So I find that's really hopeful too, because it's introducing a lot of these school children to food that they might not have otherwise. So that's another one of, of you know, the, the people that are working there are real heroes. And one of the person they have, one of the people they have on staff is um, a farmer, he has a CSA, but his primary role there is to go out and work with the organic farmers that sell to the Good Acre to help them problem solve. So he's almost like an organic extension agent to go out and help them decide, you know, I need to introduce some beneficial pests or I need to use this to deal with that problem. And that's been really helpful for those farmers, especially the startup farmers and many of the immigrant farmers. And he speaks several different languages. So that's been really helpful as well. So those are those are the things. And, and for my own project, I think I mentioned earlier this blog and cooking series of cooking classes my son and, ha and I have called Bare Bones Cooking, which just keeps growing. And it's been really fun because I'm seeing now um, what's happening when people begin to cook again. Um, their health improves, they're having fun. And it, it was super important for people, I think, during the pandemic because everybody was so shut in that they really had to and in many cases, you know, food was difficult to get or they didn't feel like going out. And I think also the result of the pandemic is a lot of people signed up for CSAs. The CSAs here are just going gangbusters. And I find that really hopeful too. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> if, we, if we have more time at the, at the end, we can definitely do another round of um, shout out to cool people. Oh, oh, Anna, we haven't, sorry, Anna, it's your turn. Yeah, well, I feel like I wanna like, give a shout out to Eliza. I've, I've jotted down, I feel like I've got three new slogans for the year. We've got, you know, uh, embrace the chaos, right, Eliza? Then we've got down with glistening orbs of perfection. I love that. <laughs> and already I have to say, like, it's actually when I am in the grocery store, I feel like I seek out the oddball fruits and vegetables or the slightly, you know, the ones that looks like they've appealed to some bug somewhere that they, they coexisted with bugs. To me, that is a sign, a good sign, right? How do we get more people to see that as something? Thing they're attracted to. And then I loved what you said, Eliza, about that in order um, to preserve biodiversity, you've got to give it a job. So these are like going up on my going up on my bulletin board. Um, so a shout out that I would like to give, I mean, one of the things that I've been really excited to see is uh, the I, I, I I was going to say the movement. I mean, I think that word is loaded, but the the growing efforts around the country to uh, think about how to uh, uh, bring land back into the hands of indigenous communities, back into the hands of people who have been pushed off land, excluded from land ownership, uh, the kind of movement to rethink what does a, a right relationship look like to land. And Eliza, you said, you know, what, fundamentally, what do you need to do? Do all of what we're talking about. <laughs> you know, one key piece of it is land uh, and uh, being able to have land that you reliably, to be able to have this vision of, you uh, uh, integrating trees on land, it also requires land that you believe you will have 
for not just this growing season, but for, for a very, very long time, right? So one of the uh, examples of this that I've been really excited to see take off, it's been amazing, uh, is here in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's called Deep Medicine Circle, and I can put a link in the chat. Uh, and it is a an effort uh, that successfully rematriated uh, dozens of acres of land back to the Ramatashaloni, the uh, Native Americans uh, uh, south of San Francisco, um, whose land it is, uh, and rematriated a, a significant amount of land, and then is developing uh, through a women-led, worker-led effort, developing an agroecological farm on the land, thinking about how to create a, a, the land also as a place for healing. So one of the founders of this work is a, is a doctor uh, here at UCSF, uh, Dr. Rupa Maria, and she's connecting the land to nurses and other medical professionals who have been on the front lines of the pandemic and really connecting this rematriation and this ecological uh, uh, relationship to growing food to healing. And so they're starting healing circles, bringing nurses and others uh, from UCSF to the land. And one of the things I love about this project is it is so visionary and so holistic that it sees this isn't just about growing food for, uh, which it is, growing food for the community, but it also has this healing component. It has the cultural component. Uh, it's really, um, it's really exciting to me. And uh, what also is exciting is, yes, it is it is doing this work on the land here, but it is not the only one. You know, there are so many projects that I could shout out, but it is the one I will shout out. You know what I'm about to say, Anna? What? You, what, what are you? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I don't, uh, what would I say? I mean, I, you know, Beth, thank you for mentioning the, the book that I worked on with my mother, Frances Moore LePay. That was a really uh, highlight of these last couple of years was helping her bring to life the 50th anniversary edition of a book she wrote when she was 26 uh, called Diet for a Small Planet. And uh, to have the new edition uh, showcase half of it is recipes, half of it is kind of a political book. Um, but in the recipe section, we uh, showcase a number of chefs that to me embody uh, uh, a relationship to eating whole foods and cooking whole foods and bringing in the cultural component of eating and cooking. And one of those chefs that we include in the book is Chef Sean Sherman. And uh, so that was, again, a great joy of working on that project was bringing in the voices of people who I really respect in the field and and having a chance to create, you know, sort of the dinner party of my dreams when I have not been able to host a dinner party for years uh, of bringing in uh, just incredible voices of people that showcase the rich biodiversity and cultural diversity of eating a, a, a healthy whole foods diet. All these stories plus the sunshine coming in through my window makes me feel like maybe we're not doomed, you know? <laughs> Um, also, I wanted to uh, tell people in the, the chat, you know, lift up, lift up groups or collaborations that are inspiring you and that you're excited about and maybe and use this opportunity to share the cool things that you're doing with everyone else. Um, and we can, we can all look through those um, together. And I guess I'll just chime into a, a, a group and collaboration that I'm excited about um, in our area is um, my good friends, Hannah Breckbill and uh, Emily Fagan lead this um, collective called Humble Hands Harvest. I think, I think they're here and they can share more information, um, but they're both just visionaries for creative land access, um, centering um, uh, queer folks in agriculture and, um, oh yeah, okay, Hannah's here. So uh, Hannah, kind of, get in touch with, um, yeah, Humble Hands Harvest and everything that they're working on. Um, and also Hannah was the one who introduced me to the idea of the agrarian trust and just this new way of um, decommodifying land um, for future generations. And I don't know about it that much, but um, yes, and Claire is pointing out Humble Hands was the Moses uh, change maker um, of the year last year. So we have, oh man. And then Claire, gosh, don't, don't you start. Okay. All right. Uh, we have just a lot of amazing people, um, who could all be on this keynote. Um, but all right, we're going to, we're going to focus, move on to the next question. Um, okay. I am going to push you all to be a little contrarian for a moment. Um, what's a myth that you hear repeatedly 
and is generally accepted as gospel that you want to bust in a big public way because this is going on YouTube for, you know, perpetuity. So um, what's a, what are you just sick of hearing and you'd like to really push people to think differently about it? And whoever shakes, whoever nods their head first, we'll go with you. I, you know, that industrial, okay, sorry. The industrial food system is growing food for everybody. You know, that we need to do this to feed the world. And, and say more about why that's a myth and why you're sick to death of it and what maybe something else that you, some because other parts of the country. Well, yeah. A, it's destroying the planet. B, it's not true. C, you can grow a tremendous amount of food on a very small piece of land. Um, and it's destroyed you know, communities, it's displaced people. I mean, you know, we can go down the whole list of, uh, it's the food is unhealthy. Um, it's not really food, it's, it's ingredients for product and, you know, on and on and on. So anyway, that's, that's the myth that I hear often from people that are involved in um, corporations like Cargill, for instance, or Monsanto, or, um, you know, as the reason for why we need to farm this way. Yeah, we can do whatever we want because we're feeding right. the world. Yeah. Right. Because we're feeding people. Right. right. Yeah. Well, and I, I'd jump in, Beth, that was going to be <laughs> mine as well. And, uh, you know, as the daughter of Francis Moore LePay, you know, she and I joke sometimes, I mean, this, I feel like she's been battling this myth for five decades. And, uh, you know, sometimes I ask her, like, do you ever, do you ever get tired of feeling like you are repeating yourself? You know, and I think that, uh, we have to realize like we have to repeat ourselves because they are repeating themselves, right? They are spending, these companies are still spending tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to push that myth. It's not a mystery why that myth persists. There's money behind it. And uh, you know what uh, the kind of corollary I would say to that myth is, or kind of a sub myth of it is that uh, we need pesticides to feed the world and that pesticides are safe, that, that those people who care about pesticides are these real you know, ant, uh, technophobes or Luddites uh, that we really uh, don't know the science, we don't know what we're talking about. And I don't know how many of you saw the study uh, that was in BMC Public Health, I guess it's almost two years ago now, uh, that researchers uh, for the first time analyzed how many incidents of unintentional acute pesticide poisoning there are globally. Uh, so this is a number that we've heard the WHO repeat kind of the same figure for decades. And if you dig into the figure the WHO has been using for decades, there wasn't really strong data behind it. So what we're really talking about is a study that for the very first time uh, since kind of the advent of pesticides as we know them uh, looked at this question and what they found probably wouldn't shock any of you, uh, but is shocking, which is that they found that globally, uh, if you look at those incidents of unintentional pesticide poisoning, uh, that 44% of farmers or farm workers, people working with pesticides experience at least one acute poisoning incident every year. It is to me a shocking figure, uh, but again, should not come as a surprise. And what we know about those acute poisoning incidents is that, you know, in and of themselves, it might just be uh, not a severe uh, incident, but that we know often that those are indications of long-term impacts, whether it's certain cancers or Parkinson's or other neurological problems or endocrine disruption. Like we know that those incidents are a signal of really severe impacts. And so to me, this should, I mean, we shouldn't have needed this report to tell us this, but it's one more chink in the myth that we uh, don't have to worry about the impacts of pesticides when clearly not only do they not work at their purported intention that of course there's pest resistance and you cannot use pesticides and have better if not you know equal if not better yields but that also they have this really significant public health impact and to try to get people to see pesticides in this issue as not just like a niche farming question, but it's a human rights question. It's a public health question. It's an environmental question. And hopefully more of us kind of lifting up this message will be another, again, kind of another, another notch down on that myth. Eliza, what about you? 
Oh boy, I guess I'll go real contrarian on this one and say that one of the myths is that organic isn't all it's made up. I mean, organic is often not what it's made up to be. And, um, or like these, these labels that we all sort of rally around, um, or you see ag, ag movements in particular, like rallying around, often it's really important to dig a, dig a bit deeper, talk to the farmer and find out what their practices actually are. And I'll just give an example. Um, so I'm not, I'm not organic. I will not get organic certified. And um, that's because it really places limitations then on how I can run livestock in my orchard and the timing and this, this natural symbiosis that I'm really that I've really been working towards for a long time, um, all of a sudden isn't allowed. And um, that people can get really stuck on that. But also like, as another example, for instance, you know, a ton of organic apples in the grocery store, especially coming out of Washington state, are from these small orchards in the middle of massive sprayed conventional orchards. So there's like, they're just, it's a loophole. They've figured out the 30 foot buffer on every side and everything on the outside of this orchard is bombed. Nothing living can make it to the center of this organic orchard. And is that environmentally stable? Like, is that something we wanna work towards? No, you know, so just say, show me your orchard. Like, and not like some puff piece, like give me a live tour right now and let's look at that buffer, you know? So really just questioning, just getting the story from people on, because a lot of times these labels are restrictionist and ultimately keep people from doing really good work. Um, and so that's a myth that I'm gonna just throw on out there is perhaps I'm, you know, labels like organic or even I mean, just really get to the bottom of everything because a lot of this is up to interpretation. So, yep, I, I'm I'm right there with you. Um, especially being a hog farmer, um, we use a lot of organic practices and we buy organic grain because it's a commodity and I can't verify the source of it. So it's a useful label in some ways, but yeah, we'll never be certified organic for a at least half a dozen reasons, um, but that's a that's a different keynote. I guess if I can be contrarian about something, just in case there are any um, NRCS employees or um, USDA folks, I've been told point blank that uh, hogs outside of confinement, so anything but confinement hogs, are a resource concern. And um, as many farmers are are showing across the country and across the across the world, that's the absolute hogwash if you'll allow me the uh the, the, that word um yeah and so I, I think a lot of uh pastured hog farmers especially pasture finished hog farmers are are um sort of coalescing around the ideas that um hogs on pasture are or and can be a really great can be a really great part of a regenerative farming system all right i'll get off my soapbox dana um, would you yeah. say a word on what's the when they say resource concern what's the allegation the, uh, just that um, hogs root and that oh. erosion. So you can have a, a 2000 acre field next door um, in corn that's getting tilled every year. Um, that's not a resource concern, but a hog uh, maybe rooting up uh, the 100 square feet out of a three acre pasture um, in a wallow, that's a resource concern. And so no funding can be given to uh, fencing or watering systems that are um, for pastured hogs. So that's right, right. Because no, no, no uh, industrial corn farm in a massive rainstorm has ever seen any soil erosion happen. Right, right? that never happens. Right, right. and, I, and um, I think I think there's some some movement. Um, among uh, national or the NRCS folks and um, Equip folks uh, or e the Equip program to to work on that a little bit, but I had to, you know, I'm I'm in this panel. I have to I had to stick that in there. Um, I think those are the questions we have prepared. So we're gonna switch in a moment here to audience questions. And so thank you, Renee. Renee's been putting together some. Um, oh, these are great. These are really great. Um, we're going to hop into these, but also I want to encourage everyone um, as we move to, to audience questions and, and comments, go ahead and, and put those in the chat and Renee will be um, sorting through and, and 
feeding them to the screen over here. So um, let's see, Christy Webb has a question about, so how can we fill big picture needs and wants for society and government as a way to move policy forward? Um, who has thoughts on that? Who wants to tackle that? That's a big question. <laughs> we can come back to it. I mean, I honestly don't have anything of note to say other than like, have you ever been to a lobbying party? Like, or, you know, have you ever taken part in lobbying? Because for instance, I went to, I won't name the organization, but in Washington, DC, I went and lobbied on behalf of this organization. And then we all had lunch one day together, like a luncheon where they presented a um, congressperson, uh, like a literally like a giant check, like you would get on in a game show for $10,000 as their, towards their political action committee. And then they swore that they would you know, do X, Y, and Z and push that through. And so, you know, like that seems to be the going rate these days is, is, is that, I mean, honestly, I don't know any other way to push through big picture things at this point. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, oh, I want to, thanks, Liza. I want to give a shout out to Land Stewardship Project in our area because they mobilize lobbying groups and they have a, um, a day every year. They used to have a breakfast every year. Now it's um, uh, virtual, but they, they then go over to the state capitol and they, you know, will choose a piece of legislation that may be up um, things like, uh, you know, helping provide funding for border strips and things like that to farmers. And so they've been actually pretty impactful in moving things along because it's all citizen action. And by how it's very helpful to me to have somebody help frame the, to have somebody frame the argument. So when I participated in a lobby day like that, I A, understand how to present it because I think that's one of the barriers to citizen lobbying things. And there are, I know other affinity groups that do that, so. Yeah, that's such a great, uh, great point. And that what I was going to add is that I we, one thing, yeah, I would add would would be that we're talking about, you know, how do we influence policy, and that clearly policy is one way that systems change, but that we're also we can also think about what are other institutions we're part of that we might be able to influence that also would be creating systems change. So uh, an example that comes to mind is uh, a young woman I met when she was an undergraduate in college at UC Berkeley. Uh, and uh, I met her, she interned for us, and she was really passionate about food and farming, and she was studying all these issues in her classes. She was also a beach volleyball player at the university. And one day, they were out at practice, and the coach said, oh, and by the way, you know, if you, if the ball goes out of the court, don't chase after it, because they've just sprayed herbicides. No, because they're all like young women barefoot playing in this, you know, beach volleyball court. And a light bulb went on for her. She had never thought about what is her campus doing? Are they spraying any pesticides? Like what, you know, wh what does this mean? What is, and so she started asking questions and uh, she uh, found out what the groundskeepers were using and she ended up bringing together a group of students. She and her friend, who are both on the team, bringing together a group of students at UC Berkeley. Her name is Mackenzie Feldman. I see Liz noting her, giving her a shout out in the chat. And she worked with the campus, working with the groundskeepers to really think holistically about how to get herbicides off that campus. And when she graduated from college and was trying to figure out what, you know, what to do next in her life, I was like, well, Mackenzie, you have created this incredible campaign on your campus. Like, what would it look like to try to connect with other college students and uh, have this conversation beyond UC Berkeley? And she created an organization, again, with a number of friends called Herbicide Free Campus. And it's doing just that. It's kind of having this landscape conversation on these campuses. And it's been just thrilling to see. And it's, I raise it here with all of you because great shout out. She's amazing. The group's amazing. But it's also this beautiful story of looking at where are, where can you exert your power? So she was this, you know, young undergrad, like, where could she find some power to shift things in the direction she wanted to the world to move in? And she saw what she could do by bringing together students and bringing together that student voice. 
and is now helping other young people see their power. So I just wanted to throw it out to get us to think creatively about what other institutions we might be able to influence. I love it. And thank you, uh, Liz, for uh, putting that in the chat and how everyone is sort of helping me, uh, helping Renee and I sort of collectively um, share resources with people. Thank you for that. Um, let's see, Liz asks, I'd love to hear any examples the speakers could share of creative and inspiring strategies for land access, secure land tenure, and cooperative agreements that facilitate multiple stewards and activities on the same land. This strikes me as a, as a key catalyst, to use Kevin Waltz's favorite word, for agroforestry and perennials. Oh, and mm. I, I, I'll just lift up um, the work that Humble Hands Harvest is doing in Decora again. They're, they're a great group um, to look into about, they're thinking really creatively about how to do that. Others have uh, examples of land tenure, creative land tenure stuff? Yeah, I, I want to lift up um, Hoffa, Hmong American Farming Association in Minnesota. They um, purchased a big tract of land north of here um, outside the cities not too long ago, and they have an incubator farm there for farmers that want to learn best practices, but now they're expanding into orchard work, and that's um, Paku Hong, is, who is the uh, former director of Hoffa, is now really involved in trying to expand that farm to include perennials. And it's a place that really makes it possible for a lot of these smaller farmers to make a living. And they then sell their, um, their produce to the good acre so it can get into larger markets. Yeah. And I, yeah. I would just, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I'm just going to put in the chat another example of a, an organization that has acquired land and has really done so thoughtfully in thinking about ownership. It's a group called the Cultural Conservancy, also here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are interested in looking at another model, that might be another place to find some inspiration. Their farm that they just purchased is called Heron Sha Shadow. And it's also another rematriation project. And this is not my area of expertise, but I'm really excited to, again, see movement in this area. And a lot of the people that I know who are expert in this area and really trying to come up with new models. You know, we're looking at you know models around, of course, agricultural land trusts, uh, and also thinking about how to uh, have conversations with some unlikely allies to encourage people to uh, look at op opportunities like rematriation of land. So one of my colleagues is working with, uh, has an advocacy campaign among estate planners, you know, for people who do not, don't have heirs with the land wouldn't, you know, inevitably flow to their descendants, you know, how can you work with estate planners to help them see potential opportunities for land, um, for rematriation, for uh, structuring, turning over the land to agricultural purposes, for instance. So it's, it's exciting to see these conversations happening. Not my area of expertise, but um, but hair and shadow, and then the deep medicine circle are just two examples I'd lift up. Um, so this uh, the whole idea of land tenure and perennials is is uh, right up my alley because um, I'm I'm technically landless. I have two leases on land, and I've been looking to purchase land for a while now. And um, there's I have some good things to say and I have a lot of bad things to say and I'm just gonna do it. Uh, so, so first of all, it's really, been it's really been tough the last two years. And so people who are looking for land or who, you know, since saving up, have the down payment, like ready to go, um, aren't getting it because land, especially if there's a house on it, is going for double what it went for three years ago. And a lot of that is, people that aren't going to live there. Um, it's second homes, it's, or it's investment opportunities, or it's Airbnb being it. And I just have something to tell those people and it's stop hoarding because you're keeping farmers from getting land um, and, and doing this. So from a perennial perspective, like it's really important for people to have autonomy. And um, because once in your land leases, it's all about 
it's it's at the end of the day you have other eyes on what you're doing and unless you have a very bomb proof completely i mean just a lease that covers every base which i think i do after years i mean i've been kicked off of farms for for years and i have i've probably planted over thousands of trees that i no longer have access to um and that's just because perennials especially trees are in our permanent infrastructure and once you plant them they're no longer yours if you don't own the soil and that's a real problem um so there's la some land trusts that are around that are helping in certain regions but that's a that's an issue too is that they're region specific and they're often in regions where there's a lot of wealth so like new england has several land trusts that are trying to pair um farmers with land and um, i mean agrarian trust is a great one um the care uh it's not care good dirt dirt something uh beneth phelps <laughs> just google her uh she's she's she talked to me the other day but um you know there's also like in areas where land isn't a premium for so let me start over a lot of these land trusts have to do with converting land into conservation in order to then get some tax breaks and then sell the farm the farmer this land at a discounted rate and unfortunately that doesn't work in areas of low of low economic status um, and so there's a lot there's really a lot of issues with this and also there's a lot of issues with how the food farm service agency is decentralized and it's by county in the whole united states um and so if you wanted to buy land you have to go and you are, are self-employed you have to go to the farm service agency to try and get a loan and it completely differs there's no you can't get pre-approved it the it's all up to the the what this agent thinks of your farming i've been told oh we don't want to hear about trees but let's talk about numbers of pigs because i can think about that and i have whole business plans so this is all to say like there needs to be some reform in the through the farm service agency um because it's already been demonstrated that minority farmers um and under underserved communities are at a at a distinct disadvantage in trying to get land um, and try you know autonomy essentially in their business structure. Um, so that's that's an area where there needs to be a lot of work done because those are the areas that are underserved and not supported by a lot of these land trusts um, because of right now land access to land is really built on the back of the wealthy and I'd really love to see that change. Um, so that's what I have to say. <laughs> I'll build off that too. You know, you're saying um, to the folks who are looking to invest in farmland or properties, stop it. I would also mm -hmm. say to absentee landowners and um, folks, yeah, folks who, who have land and are not managing it, um, sell it. Um, don't just, don't just lease it, um, and don't sell it to the highest bidder and please don't sell it at auction. Cause a lot of times those of us who are accessing land through, um, USDA FSA loans, um, it's extremely difficult to get land, um, at auction. So, um, let it go. Think of that as your, as your legacy. Um, you know, th there's a group in Iowa, sustainable Iowa land trust that, um, has, that works with farmers to to either buy their land or um, well you can get a lot more information at, at their website but um, if you don't feel comfortable selling it directly to a young farmer um, there are lots of groups that will keep it in farming um, not just not just uh, a land trust that will um, keep it in conservation and not let anyone use it for sustainable agriculture so that's just uh message out there for those of you who have including my relatives if you're watching this <laughs> sell, sell yeah. your land just sell it <laughs> right and sell also somebody good also like you know self-finance too like like let's open up the conversation about self-financing and let's make that you know let's make it more cut and dry and like help bring people to the table um because that's it you know access to capital like they're just losing money if i have to go get a mortgage so why not you know create it why not get just a 
small percentage of my interest or whatever. So yeah, Hoy, it's a big one. Yeah, and if you have, if folks out there have uh, big chunks of cash sitting around, just reach out to young farmers or somebody like Eliza and see if you, if 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 you can give them operating loans. I had a dairy farmer in Minnesota just Facebook message me and offered me a my operating loan for the year at a one percent interest rate, just because he he had money around, he didn't want to put it in the stock market, he wanted to see it go to a good place. And I'm much happier to pay him interest than, than a bank, even though we've got a good local bank, but um, any, anything else? I, on just, that? I just want to mention that there are in our area anyway, there are a number of different investment groups that are making very low interest and no interest loans available to people that can't get land. And um, it's, it's been really interesting. One of the issues I'm in one of them, one of the issues we've had is finding farmers because getting the word out from where we are to people that really need that money has been hard. Um, and we have found a couple of people and we have been able to make loans and it's been great. Um, but I think too, we need to figure out how to, it's, it's built, it's premised on the slow money model. So how to figure out a way to make that kind of information more accessible is one of the challenges that we've had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see here. So Ingrid, Ingrid asks, agroforestry doesn't fit into many NRCS programs. Actually, I would say that it does in a lot of ways, but we'll, we'll hear what our panelists have to say about this. Uh, so agroforestry doesn't fit into many NRCS programs. Can you talk about other creative ways to fund long range improvements that don't have products and income for many years? Who wants to take that on? I mean, for me, um, and I, I do, I do hear that. Like, NRCS, though they have all sorts of programs, um, it's real. A lot of them aren't accessible for agroforestry. And um, you know, in talking to some, like for instance, in talking to an agent in uh, Beltsville, Maryland, who was, he's just like, we just, we just really need to focus on cover crops. You know, like. We don't, we don't have the bandwidth, we don't, the understaffed, you know, who cares if this is congressionally allocated funds? Like, so it just depends on what region you're in, I think, in terms of getting some, like, seems like Pennsylvania's got it going on in terms of getting your agroforestry operations funded or cost shared. Um, but for me, like, as somebody that, you know, my trees aren't gonna start producing fruit for, years, you know, six years or, or more. Um, that's where I brought in livestock to try and close that, that economic gap in order to show like, okay, well, I can make X amount of money per acre with livestock. And, and then that's ultimately how I ended up synthesizing the two of like, oh, well, if I can do that, I can feed the livestock off of trees too. Um, and so that's just something that I've done. And, and a lot of people also will go the vegetable route um, and they'll start, they'll like inner, you know, alley crop essentially in their rows. And that's a whole other thing. Alley cropping, uh, you know, growing whatever you want in between the tree rows is, it's working for a lot of people. I just don't bend over when I farm. So I have to, I just reach up. Um, that's my rule. Other ideas? Sounds like it looks like a lot of good ideas are being tossed around in the in the chat box too. Um, in, in banks and yeah, Anna. Yeah, I mean, I don't have much to add except really, I mean, a question for you know folks at the Savannah Institute and other advocacy groups about you know what again going back to the federal policy question. You know, are there advocacy opportunities to try to shift some of those policies to make them more, uh, you know? To, to address more of the needs of uh, farmers that are planting tree crops. Uh, and that's like definitely not my area of expertise, but it is, you know, again, thinking about particularly within this administration, like that there are some openings and what, what that might look like uh, for groups uh, to take advantage of this moment. All right, let's grab another question. Um, so Bob asks, 
So many small outfits like the Savannah Institute share values, but each is too small to be heard in the context of big ag's money. There is a need to work together. How can that happen? Um, thoughts about how nonprofits and various groups can, can work together to amplify their messages? I'll, I'll jump in first and I'm curious what uh, what others would say. I mean, what comes to mind when you, you ask that question is the the image from the children's book. I remember uh, uh, from my childhood called, I think it was called Swimmy, where it was this like, uh, you know, sort of graphic story about these tiny little fish that were up against this huge fish that was coming after them to eat them. And they realized that if they swam together and looked really big, that they could ward off the big fish. And I think it is this question about how do we organize the small fish that we are, uh, knowing that we will, you know, never match uh, industry dollar for dollar. And so I think I have been encouraged to see kinds of alliances and national coalitions forming in some of the work that I've been been working on. So for instance, a group that for my foundation uh, hat, uh, we've been funding called the Food Chain Workers Alliance is kind of in a different field than all of you are, but looking at uh, all of these workers groups, food worker groups, we're saying, look, we represent millions of workers among the 21 and a half million food workers in this country, but we each are working at different parts of the supply chain and what would it look like to come together actually as an alliance representing workers from the fields to restaurants and a little bit more than a decade ago they started an organization called the food chain workers alliance and they've been really essentially asking themselves almost on a daily basis that question you know how do we have a bigger voice out there as food workers uh, so there's there's alliances like that and coalitions, another coalition uh, that uh, the foundation where I work has been funding is called the Heal Food Alliance. Some of you may be members or know about it. It stands for Health, Environment, Agriculture, Labor Alliance. Uh, again, really thinking about how to build that political power uh, and thinking about some of the other national advocacy groups like the National Coalition for Sustainable Agriculture uh, or the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Uh, but I think those kinds of formations that are either long standing or that come together at particular advocacy moments, it's the way that we are going to have a bigger voice because absolutely each of us as individual small organizations will never have that kind of power, but collectively we can. You know, um, a good crisis is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one of the things that happened during the pandemic, um, right around the time of George Floyd's murder, was the creation of an organization called LEAF. Um, it's an acronym that I can't remember what it stands for, but basically it was an alignment between um, the uh, Minneapolis um, Central Kitchen, which you know cooks meals for delivery to people that can't get out and also then has a, um, a big sort of venue where people can come and get a, a good hot free meal of locally prepared food. There were a number of chefs that have both volunteered or have been hired by uh, Minneapolis Central Kitchen to do that. Uh, the um, Good Acre was worked with small farmers to deliver that food to Minneapolis Central Kitchen um, and got market price for it. It wasn't donated. And then the Mill City Farmers Market and the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and one of the co-ops here helped fund it. They raised funds for it, they lobbied, they got, they got grants from foundations. And this year, the uh, Minnesota State Legislature has directed an enormous amount of money to LEAF to keep it going. So I think, you know, we can also see some of these alliances when we see a big problem um, among these different disparate groups that all have a piece of what needs to happen. Wonderful. It looks like we have about oh, seven minutes left. So I think we have time for one last question. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Alexis's question. So I'm drawn to the fields of agriculture and conservation. As a young adult trying to start establishing a career, do you think that the field of agroforestry helps individuals like myself engage in both of these areas? I'm drawn to how agroforestry not only benefits as us as humans, but also animals and the environment at large. Hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> Agroforestry, I think, is probably your best bet if you want to come to the synergy of agriculture and conservation. Um, you know, it's just this, it's, it's this notion that we're inextricable, like us as humans are inextricable from the landscape. And a lot of conservation um, circles a lot of times around imagining that humans aren't and trying, you know, and, and, and that's great if we can set aside large tracts of land to basically become rewilded or anyway, I have a lot of things to say about that. But um, I think that in allowing at least just the combination of trees on farms alone is is a whole other I mean it's just a whole other aspect of diversity because not only do you have shade you know the trees are going to produce shade which create which changes the micro like the biology of the soil underneath the trees it changes the type of grass that grows underneath the trees into like a cool season grass for example then you've got the roots and the mycorrhizal networks and you know everything that feeds off trees um that's then it's a, fun, a fungal dominated environment that's meshing with the bacterial dominated environment of growing vegetables or crops or something like that um so just like as a whole it's a it's got a lot larger of an umbrella to bring in conservation and to really think about it but there's a lot there's a lot happening and so um just it's i would say if you, I don't know. Yeah, it is. Plant trees on landscapes. <laughs> the end. I'm going to, I'm going to broaden this question. So maybe Anna and, and Beth can jump in too. Um, just advice that you have for the youth of <laughs> <laughs> the youths uh, just getting started in their careers and trying to think of um, how to plug in with strong values about um, the environment and, and justice. And yeah, that's, Thoughts for the youths. Uh, let's see, we'll start with, Anna, you're laughing. So I think you have something to say. We'll start with you. Yeah, well, I, I will answer that question, but I'll say so one thing as, as you were talking, Eliza, I was just, again, kind of coming full circle to the story I told at the beginning about what brings me joy is these memories of being with uh, an incredible group of people from all around the world in Southern India, right before the pandemic. And we went and spent a lot of time on farms. We did farm visits together. And those farms looked, many of them felt and looked like forests. I mean, there were trees everywhere. And as, as, a, as, as an experience, it was, you know, getting to this, the, the question the person asked about, you know, agroforestry, it was so, captivating it was so beautiful it was literally a, a buzz with life i mean you could just hear the life all around you and it was also this really powerful experience of really shifting one's understanding of what a, a farm looks like or should look like and in and of itself that experience of kind of having something that you think looks a certain way or is a certain way or an idea you think you hold that and hold so tightly have that having that experience of having that busted open and having your perception changed and having a sense of possibility you didn't have before as like a fundamental human experience is so powerful and is a really key part of I think what you all who are working in agroforestry are doing and that sense as you were saying Eliza of standing there on this land and feeling such a part of nature and feeling like the farmers we met were really kind of um, you know population managers or they were what, what was the word I'm looking for they were they were really uh, I mean it's the cliche but they were stewards of nature I mean they were letting nature do it be itself and you really felt that on the land and and so I'm just again kind of coming back to that joy that I felt on the land and joy in that experience um, and then to this question for the youths, <laughs> I, I mean, I think the the story I always tell uh, young people is what is so thrilling about connecting to um, food and agriculture is there is a place at this table for everyone. If you are a poet, there is a place for you here. If you want to go to law school and have <laughs> have the ability to pour through uh, legal text, unlike I have ever been able to do, you know, there is a place for you. We need lawyers. If you are passionate advocate and you want to run for elected office, there is a place for you here. 
if you want to work on the land, of course, there is a place for you. But it's what's what I really like to stress is that there there are so many different ways to be part of what I see all of us being a part of, which is an effort to transform our food systems to, again, align with our deep core values of wanting to have a world that is healthy uh, and clean and the air is, you know, clean to breathe, the water is clean to drink. Um, so that's the message I would say is, is that, that it's really about discovering what your passion is and then plugging that into uh, work to try to transform the food system. Love all that. Beth. That, you know, what both of you said is so spot on. I don't have a whole lot to add except to say, um, you know, think about what you're good at. I would be, a, to be honest, I'd be a terrible farmer. I would be terrible at agroforestry. I love it. I admire it. I want to celebrate it, but it's not something I can do or even pretend to do, um, which is how I ended up in the kitchen. That's <laughs> about all I can do. So I think, um, again, recognize what your skills are recognize what you're good at, and then find people you can connect with that will mentor you and support you and help you move to where you want to be. And they may be people that surprise you. I love that. So for 2022, we've got embrace the chaos and look for opportunities for interdependence and interconnectedness. Um, on that note, I think that's it. It's 1 30. Um, that has been, I, I, can everyone come off mute for, for just a second so we can give a huge round of applause for our, our panelists. Thank you all so much for being here.